Monday, February 20th, 2023. The Committee on uh, Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development is now in session and a quorum is present. Uh, members, we've got a couple fun things to talk about today. Uh, we're going to start with Senator Gustafson, Senate File 1256, eligibility modification for a cooperative grant program, and then Senator Gustafson's going to stay over there and talk to us a little bit about Senate File 1245. So a health financial assistance program establishment, and then we'll hear from Senator Kupek uh, with Senate File 1522 about veterinary technicians, practice of veterinary technology, and unlicensed veterinary employees regulation. Uh, so, uh, Senator Gustafson, if you would please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the opportunity also to present SF 1256, which will reestablish cooperative development grants at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, this builds on work that was started last session, funding and expanding a program that was reauthorized in last year's agriculture omnibus bill. In short, the bill allows MDA to make grants to help producers develop cooperatives to process and market Minnesota grown agriculture products. Um, and I'm excited about this proposal because cooperatives started under this bill will help diversify farm income, develop supply chains for emerging crops, and keep more wealth in rural communities. This language mirrors a program that was in statute at MDA up until budgetary pressures led to its removal in the early 2000s. It's timely and important that we bring this program back for two reasons. First, Minnesota farmers are growing new, often high value crops for which the market and supply chain is still emerging. Producer led cooperatives can help these producers develop the processing and marketing infrastructure needed to grow the market for these crops. During our hearings for Forever Green initiative bills, this committee heard from MFU's Vice President Ann Schwagel, who was a founding member of Cooperative Established to, provide, or to market the perennial wheatgrass Kernza. A key challenge for them is finding pr uh, processing, and this grant program would help jumpstart their work to form a cooperative. Second, cooperative development is timely because many producers are becoming frustrated with supply chain bottlenecks and want to build alternative models for marketing and processing products. This is particularly true in the wake of COVID-19. Thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Our first testifier is Mr. Weiss. Uh, if you would please sit at the table, uh, give us your full name for the record, and then come as your testimony when you're ready, please. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Dustin Weiss, and I'm here to share my support for Senator Gustafson's bill to establish cooperative development grants at MDA. I'm a fourth generation rancher in Cass County, Minnesota, where I am now raising the fifth generation ranchers. Uh, my siblings and I own one of the largest Angus ranches in Minnesota in which I'm currently the operations manager. In Cass County alone, there are 20,000 head of cattle, but only one small mom and pop butcher shop uh, for the whole county. Butcher shops in our areas are booked out a uh, year well in advance, and that's before COVID even heightened everything. As president of our local cattlemen's association, I have realized the dire need for a place to market our beef. At the moment, most ranchers are all working individually trying to market their own beef which takes a large capital investment and lots of time. And that's even if you find a place to butcher at. Plus there's a strong demand for a new processing facility and a cooperative model is a great option for us. A co-op is an exciting concept because the wealth generated by the business will circulate back to our local ranchers and stay within our state. But there are a lot of challenges with this project. <clears throat> As a rancher, I have a slim profit margin, so I have to make certain my investments are financially viable. If ranchers are going to put their money into something, it needs to make sense as a business. But when you form a cooperative with multiple business partners, it becomes many different businesses or different visions for the business. Thus, it is vital to utilize consultants who can give us a straight, non biased view of the business. But consultants are costly. A grant like this would greatly help accelerate our work to collectively market beef in central Minnesota. 
In particular, it would go a long way towards funding those first feasibility studies, business plans, bylaws, draftings, and other pieces that are needed for producers to invest. I'm excited about this new grant program, both for our project and for others across the street. I hope it earns your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Weiss. Uh, our next testifier is uh, online. Mr. Kala, are you available? Uh, if you are, please uh, turn on your camera, unmute your microphone, commence, uh, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready, please. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, okay. Thank yeah, you, we got Mr. you. Go Chair. ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair and me members of the committee. My name is Rodrigo Cala. I am a farmer and a um, farm trainer for uh, Latino Economic Development Center. I am happy to share my support for Representative Persul's bills to provide early funding for uh, co-op development. I'll be part of forming three ag agricultural cooperatives. The first one, Aguagorda Co-op, we started working with them in 2011 in Long Prairie, Minnesota. It's a group of uh, six Latino farmers. Uh, they start uh, growing food on uh, the community gardens. And then uh, three years later, they, they buy a farm, a 54 acre farm near uh, Long Prairie, Minnesota. And they have a, a co-op model for running this business. The second one, it's a chair ground farmers co-op. We started work, working with this co-op in 2014. We own this farm. Uh, it's on this farm for, for uh, six members. Four members are, are Latino farms and two members are Anglo farmers. This is a marketing co-op based on St. Paul, Minnesota. And we searching produce from 55 other farms around the state. Um, in, two, in 2022, we closed down this co-op, but we opened a third one. Uh, it's a tree range poultry alliance. It's based on Northfield, Minnesota, and it's owned by 10 farmers, but we search, we're gonna search products from a hundred different farms around the state. This co-op raised, we raised chickens, trees, sheep, sheep and, and vegetables in a regenerative way so we can deal with markets and climate change in better way. In each of these cooperatives, early funding, access to training, access to markets, access to a distribution center is critical. The only way for a small farmer, immigrant, to achieve the goal is to work in a, in a cooperative way. COVID-19 changed everything. COVID-19 gave us a teaspoon of what it can be in the future if we don't have a better food system change to connect farmers and communities for the benefits of everybody. Thank you for allowing me to share my support for this bill, and I am happy to answer any question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kala. Our next testifier is Mr. Edberg. Mr. Edberg, if you please come to the table to state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kevin Edberg. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Cooperative Development Services. We uh, work to, uh, our mission is to help start and grow a cooperative enterprise. I've been uh, doing that work for the past 22 years. Last year, our organization assisted over 100 existing cooperatives and almost two dozen startups in various stages of development in the upper Midwest. Prior to coming to CDS in 2000, I worked for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, beginning my career there in the middle 80s, in the middle of the last Ag Depression. Coming out of that experience, I saw firsthand the role of both cooperative uh, and particularly farmer-owned cooperative value-added processing as a strategy used to deal with the issues of that era. I'm here today to share with you 
three points. The first is cooperatives are a well-known and respected and trusted business model in Minnesota. Historically, Minnesota has had the largest number of, of cooperatives incorporated of any state in the country. At one time, we were over 1,000, and while we have declined somewhat from that position, we still remain the largest state for the number of cooperatives. The, um, it's also well known that, we, that the power of that model is, is found in the size of the cooperatives that we have. We've demonstrated CHS is the largest cooperative in the country, located in Invergrove Heights. Land O'Lakes, number three, and Health Partners, number six. This model works, and we have the economic uh, 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 activity to demonstrate that. The second point I'd like to make is that farmer-owned value-added processing is a proven strategy. We used that in the 1980s. We see it most evident in the biofuels industry. It works elsewhere as well as a way of uh, providing hedges for, uh, for farmers marketing their crops. It, uh, uh, the use of patronage as the mechanism for distributing, that is the distribution of net profit based on use as opposed to based, being based on investment is a superior alternative for rewarding uh, farmers for their, uh, for their work. The third thing that I'd like to say is that it's also the right strategy for this time. I had the opportunity in the 1980s to work with then Representative Doug Peterson in the crafting of the legislation that was referred to at the beginning of this testimony. I oversaw that program for several years until I left for CDS in 2000. The process of using cooperation as a strategy in not just rural Minnesota, but all over the state and in multiple sectors is one that we should all aspire to. But for today's purposes, doing this in the area of agriculture and farmer-owned uh, enterprises is particularly valuable in aggregating purchasing power, in distributing net income in a fair and reasonable way. And it also deals with the uh, uh, issues of aggregating capital and monopoly power that we see uh, rampant in our uh, uh, industrial sectors today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adberg. Members, uh, questions for our testifiers? Discussion of the policy? What do we got? Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Gustafson. Can you tell me, will these non-patron investors, will they be uh, eligible for dividends? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames. I'm going to probably defer to the people who um, have this program, um, you know, have the specifics on your question. Sure. So if you could just give us a moment. Yep. Mr. Lowry, if you would please state your full name for the record and uh, take this one for it, if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Stu Laurie. I'm the Government Relations Director for Minnesota Farmers Union. And I think what you're referring to, uh, Senator Dames, is the inclusion of 308B cooperatives, which allow non-patron investors. Um, under the bill, my understanding is those folks would receive dividends. The reason that we wanted to add 308B is to allow um, farmers who don't have a lot of access to capital independently to bring in those investors to help capitalize new projects and move those forward. Um, and so that's why we included 308B, and you'll see in the bill um, how uh, it makes sure that the, the, the bylaws or there's other provisions in the formation of the cooperative that prevent um, those non-patron investors from uh, getting control of the cooperative, which is what we don't want. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Follow-up? Senator Dames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Lorry, could you tell me, will there be a percentage between the number of non-capital investors and the farmer-owned investors? Will there be a percentage limit so that you can control uh, what percent of the investment is outside investment that's truly not cooperative investment? Mr. Lorry. Um, Mr. Chair, again, uh, Stu Lorry, I don't believe there is under the bill. I might phone a friend in, in, in Mr. Edberg to see if there are other provisions that would provide for that in cooperative law. So the primary, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator James. Um, the primary distinction between 308B and 308A is the existence of a non-patron investor class. There are some other uh, variations, but that's the signature feature that is found in 308B. In concept, it allows uh, people who do not intend to use the cooperative to um, be supporters of it, investors in it, 
Um, and the original, one of the original uh, purposes was to allow, um, for example, doctors, lawyers, teachers, others in small town communities to participate in capitalizing ag processing plants because we were running into the reality that uh, farmers by themselves typically lack sufficient equity for the, uh, to reach the desired and needed scale of operation. So uh, created a non-patron class. With regard to um, if, if there are folks who are patrons, they would participate in the normal pool of net income providers. The distinctions would likely be found in how, they, uh, how the 308B crafters craft the bylaws and operating agreements for the 308B, and there is no one size fits all. There is no statutory uh, structure that requires various percentages of any kind. So um, taken to its, its extreme, under 308B, non-patron investors could control, could own, i.e. have uh, invested income far in excess of the users and uh, have greater control in the voting uh, uh, decisions of that cooperative. And so this bill, as I understand it, tries to limit that level of control without prohibiting the ability for non-patron participants to be investors. So it, 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 the short answer is it depends on how the, the operating agreement of the 308B is structured if they, uh, as I understand it, if 308B uh, participants wanted to participate in, in, in a cooperative that received grants from this, there would be limitations that would have to be enforced, likely through the bylaws process. Thank you. Senator Dames, any follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Edberg. Uh, members, any other questions? Senator Seberger. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my understanding that the Department of Agriculture is here, and I'm wondering if we'd be able to get their thoughts on this bill. Commissioner Peterson? Commissioner Peterson, if you could uh, full name for the record, and then uh, if you would please address the nurse reviewer's question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members. Tom Peterson, Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and to Senator Seeberger's bill, uh, we are supportive of this. Uh, the uh, language we worked on last year to reinstate uh, that that language, uh, it's not in the governor's budget, but it's something we'd want to work with Senator Gustafson on. It's been a priority <clears throat> for the administration. Uh, we we're just trying to work through like what it might look like and everything is uh, I have a lot of history with this. I was around, as Mr. Edberg said, when uh, this was uh, taken out in uh, 2003, or there was, it was, we had a $6 billion uh, deficit at that time, and we had to make choices, or the legislature did, and so they unfunded the program, and then I fought to try to keep the language in at that time so that we could refund it, you know, maybe at some point, but Back in that time, uh, I just remember looking at the co-ops that we had that this supported, were everything from you know a vegetable co-op to a meat co-op to a bread uh, co-op. I mean, there were some really neat things that are business development. Uh, and we, we get asked a lot about what we do at the Department of Agriculture for business development. So just looking at that, I think this is a really uh, good option. And I appreciate uh, Senator Gustafson carrying this, carrying this bill. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson. Members, any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, Senate file 1256 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Oh, sorry, final comments? Uh, uh, um, Senator Gustafson? No, I just want to thank the co-authors, um, Senator Anderson, Dornick, and Seeberger for being a part of this bill. I appreciate your support. And cooperative development is a tool that we can use to help Minnesota producers innovate and build new models. Um, it's going to serve farm businesses, our communities, and I thank you for your support. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. So uh, Senate File 1256 will still be laid over for possible inclusion. Um, our next bill up before us is Senate File 1245. Senator Gustafson to the bill. Let me switch folders here. All right. I understand, uh, Senator Gustafson, you may have an amendment to this bill? Yes. I believe, sir, Mr. Chair, I believe you have the amendment. I do. Members, do we all have the, the A2 amendment before us? Yes. 
Everyone has it? Senator Gustafson, if you would move your amendment, please. So moved. This being the bill's first stop, we will adopt Senator Gustafson's A2 amendment as an author's amendment. Uh, now, Senator Gustafson, to Senate file 1245 as amended, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to present uh, Senate file 1245, which turns MDA's soil health financial assistance pilot project into an ongoing grant program. The bill appropriates the funds necessary to ensure that farmers have the financial support necessary to implement the practices and transitions that will ensure their success in the years ahead. Ultimately, this bill works to ensure that Minnesota's greatest resource, which is rich, productive soil, is as plentiful a century from now as it is today. The bill maintains all of the structure, scope, and requirements of the bill, a pilot project while appropriating the money necessary to create the impact our farmers need. Projects such as reduced tillage, cover cropping, manure management, precise agriculture, integrating perennial vegetation, and changes in grazing management can now be implemented, and farmers have significant interest in these projects, but they are often uh, cost prohibitive and require significant saving and borrowing that our farmers aren't in a position to take on. Financial assistance would not be limited to traditional cost shares, but will allow for down payments on equipment purchases or subscriptions of the equipment. Most importantly, I want to point out that this bill is a direct ask from our egg community. No group understands the value of soil more nor suffers greatest from its loss than our farmers. I am proud to have worked with the Corn Growers Association to get this bill prepared. I thank them for their support as well as the support of Minnesota Milk, Minnesota Cattlemen, Minnesota Pork, Farm Bureau, Farmers Union, Agri-Growth, and the Nature Conservancy, all of whom work together to develop the Soil Health Financial Assistant Pilot Program that SF-1245 is built upon. I'd like to now let them speak to the impact this bill will have and explain why it's important that we support it. I apologize, Senator Gustafson. Apparently, I made a procedural error. We should actually vote on the adoption of your amendment. So, um, members, if we would go back to the A2 amendment, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, A2 amendment is adopted. I apologize for that, Senator Gustafson. Uh, that, was, that was my bad. You're forgiven. Um, our first uh, testifier uh, will be Ms. Alan Tully. Uh, all four of these testifiers will be online. So, Ms. Alan Tully, if you would please. Uh, Turn on your camera, uh, unmute microphone, state your full name for the record, and commence your testify, testimony when ready. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dana Allen Tully. I currently serve as the first vice president for the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. Minnesota Corn Growers has nearly 7,000 family farm members and represents all of Minnesota's 24,000 corn farmers through our research and education efforts. My family's farming operation is located in Olmstead County, we operate a dairy farm where we grow corn and corn silage as feed for our dairy herd. On behalf of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 1245, and thank you to Senator Gustafson and the bipartisan list of co-authors for bringing this bill forward. Soil health is important to Minnesota farmers and provides many other benefits for air and water in addition to crop yield and farming costs. The Minnesota Corn Growers Association has been conducting various research programs for several years, providing farmers the tools they need to manage natural resources while maintaining profitability. One of those programs is our innovation grant program. We started the program with the premise that innovation, innovative concepts can be furthered through small grants to farmers. They can test the idea on a on a limited scale for workability and then help other farmers address identical challenges to their opportunity, to their operations. Since 2016, the program has invested over $1 million in nearly 100 farmer-led projects, bringing novel solutions to prevent nutrient loss on the farm. Farmers have used the program to build custom equipment, to intercede cover crops, or to apply in-season nitrogen fertilizer during the growing season. Farmers have also tested other novel approaches for establishing cover crops or to make drainage systems more efficient, to fine, 
to fine tune nitrogen fertilizer rates and hosting field days to share progress and discuss new potential conservation practices with their peers. Interested farmers face barriers in implementing soil health, but there is great interest and an opportunity to scale up soil health practices by providing support to farmers to get started. On our farm, we have been experimenting with cover crops for several years. When we first started, we were unsure how to successfully establish a cover crop into an existing field of corn. We settled on flying in turnips in mid-August with 20 inch spacings for our corn, very little seed made it through the corn crop um, and establishment was poor. We've come a long way from there. Today we have fully incorporated cover crop planting into our fall cropping system. We have people hired, we have purchased seed and a drill planter that starts as soon as corn silage is harvested on the field. Our cost is about $30 an acre and we um, plant about 800 acres a year. With the strong rains last spring, we had some erosion occur on ground that had been no-tilled for decades. So this past fall, we decided to try and establish a cover crop in some of those soybean fields that were no-till fields that had more than a 4% slope. We actually did it with success. So that cover crop was established and it cost us about $19 an acre to fly it on. Our farm has learned a lot, and to be honest, we're still learning. There are always new innovations and practices we are interested in trying while still working to maintain profitability for our farm. Incorporating new conservation practices does require innovation, planning, and a financial commitment by Minnesota's farmers. Benefits we see in Senate File 1245 that would assist Minnesota farmers when considering new practice adoptions would be that the practice adoption is voluntary, inclusive of a broad set of practices so that farmers can determine what is going to be the best fit for their operation and their soil, and that it provides direct financial assistance using some new approaches. Financial assistance would not be limited to traditional cost share but could also include down payments on equipment, purchases, subscriptions of equipment technology for precision ag, purchase of seed and amendments, or technical assistance for conservation plans. Since I have been working to implement some of these practices on my farm, I have learned it is important to have a diverse set of practices for farmers to choose from, because what happens on my farm or what works on my farm may not work on my neighbors. If programs are too prescriptive in ineligible practices, such as just focusing on cover crops or tillage, it can turn farmers off from trying to implement something new. I also see this expanded program at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture as a good complement to existing programs, such as the Agricultural Best Management Practices Low Interest Loan Program or helping farmers get certified in the Min Ag Water Quality Certification Program. The Soil Health Financial Assistance Program is not duplicative of those efforts, but instead provides an opportunity to fill in a gap in assistance that is currently not available in other programs, such as financial assistance for equipment purchases. On behalf of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association, we appreciate your consideration consideration and thank Senator Gustafson for bringing this bill forward. Thank you, Ms. Allen Tully. Our, our next uh, testifier is Ms. Olson. Uh, if you would please, Ms. Olson, uh, turn on your camera, unmute your microphone, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when ready. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Carolyn Olson and I serve as the Vice President of the Minnesota Farm Bureau. Farm Bureau represents nearly 30,000 farm families across the state of Minnesota. I farm with my husband on our Century Farm in Lyon County. We started our transition to organic crop production in 1998 and now farm all of our land organically. We have an ex 
extended crop rotation growing corn, soybeans, small grains, and alfalfa. We plan to cover crop mix of oats, daikon radish, and bursim clover on the fields that had the small grains after that grain has been harvested. The cover crop mix are all annual varieties since we need them to winter kill as we cannot use herbicides. Organic production relies on mechanical tillage for weed control. Even though we cultivate the row crops in the summer and use various tillage tools in the fall, our soil tests show that we are building organic matter. Farmers care deeply about the environment and continue to be stewards of the land. We ensure the future success of our farm by taking care of the ground and securing nutrients in the soil. Minnesota has a very diverse range of soil types across the state and one size does not fit all. This bill allows for a wide variety of practices that provide farmers the possibility to make active decisions about what will work best on their farm depending on where they live. These grants will actively put conservation practices on the ground through a wide variety of eligible expenses that are often too big of a barrier for farmers to overcome on their own, especially as they are taking risks to be a leader amongst their peers. There is a liability you take as a farmer when first implementing soil health practices. And if you don't implement the practices just right, you risk a major financial hit. This bill helps to mitigate some of those risks among farmers who are looking to be a progressive leader. Minnesota Farm Bureau supports voluntary market-based approaches to soil health and to environmental practices. By providing a grant program with broad reach, we can continue to help farmers do what is best on their land and remove some of the prohibitive financial barriers that they face as they look for innovations to improve soil health. We care deeply about the environment and we ask for your support of this program. Thank you for bringing this bill forward and I stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Mr. Miller, uh, you're up next. If you would please turn on your camera, uh, unmute your microphone, state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when ready. Hi, my name is uh, Luke Miller and good afternoon, Chair Putnam and the committee members. My name is Luke Miller and I'm here to testify on behalf of the Minnesota Milk Producers Association. My family and I run Clearcrest Farms in Lewiston, Minnesota, where several generations of my family work together to make high quality milk. The farm was founded in 1936 by my grandpa and we, um, I'm third generation and potential fourth generation coming. Um, we believe that in order to be successful in the future is by continually improving our soil health, currently um, thereby reducing our reliance on chemical fertilizers and improving our utilization and recycling methods of on-farm nutrients. Currently, we're voluntarily implementing as many soil health practices as we can, as most dairy farms aim to do. However, one of the greatest hurdles in moving to more soil health practices on our farm and other dairy farms is the initial equipment investment cost. We believe that this bill will help overcome that first year investment to begin implementation of more soil health practices. This bill is flexible enough that it will allow farmers to implement soil health practices on an individual farm level, but has enough direction to ensure that we are creating a partnership to get practices adopted and implemented. Um, we're asking for your support of this bill and we look forward to adding more soil health practices on our farm and encouraging other farms in Minnesota. Um, thank you on behalf of the Minnesota Milk Producers Association and if you have any questions that would be fine. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Our next testifier is Ms. Ayers, if you would, please. Uh, Ms. Ayers, please uh, unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, state your full name for the record, and start your testimony when you're ready. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to comment on this critical bill. My name is Lynn Ayers, and I'm a farmer. I'm the owner manager of a thousand acre farm in Sherburne County. My family has been farming this land for over a century since 1878. We're now into our fifth generation. We've been committed to good environmental stewardship in the past, currently and future generations. And we have a deep knowledge of this land and we wanna care for it to the best of our ability. We are a water quality certified 
uh, water quality farm certified by the Minnesota Department of Ag. We've been a demonstration site for cover crops for Sherburne County to show other farmers what they can grow. And we've experimented with no-till where crops will grow, where the crop we plant will plow, and uh, we do minimal tilling as a baseline. We know soil health practices are good for our farm, will improve soil quality and yields, and also provide benefits off the farm. These practices benefit everybody. Soil health practice change can take years before the benefits are seen. It's not a few years strategy, but a change of practice that may take as many as 10 to 20 years to see a return on investment. Some soil types are on the longer end of this time frame, and Sherburne County, where our farm is, is certainly one of those places. We've been fortunate to have some support in these endeavors, most recently by the Nature Conservancy, our Soil and Water Conservation District, and Cargill. The last initiative we used was a 170-acre field enrolled for a three-year cover crop experiment. We're now at the end of these three years. As part of this initiative, we did soil testing before and after, and we looked at yields on the experimental field that was adjacent that had the same crop. For this short three-year period, we did not see an increase in organic matter, and we saw a loss of seed corn yields of about five to six bushel per acre. This was in addition to the 50 to $60 per acre cost to put in a cover crop and the additional expense to terminate the cover crop in spring. The use of cover crops makes sense in the very long run with the, with the hope to build yields, decrease inputs and provide cover on the land for more seasons. But the expense and risk is great for farmers and the challenge to implement with, uh, with years before we're able to see the return on investment. Without financial support or an incentive to take these risks, any farmer faces significant questions about whether or not to continue using cover crops. If there's any way to provide technical support, like the effort proposed through Senate File 1245, which would provide cost share for soil health practices, this would go a long way to encourage more farmers to adopt these practices. Farmers need financial incentives to help cover the risks of providing these ecosystem services. Support would encourage more farmers to experiment and hang in there, with these changes over the long haul and build healthy soil practices that align with their deep rooted values. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ayers. Uh, members, do you have questions for our testifiers or the bill's author? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Gustafson. Uh, why is this only for like a the biennium? Why is this a continual program that's going to be ongoing? Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, it's a $10 million appropriation. It's got a cap of 50000 per grant, and it's going to assist about 200 farmers. Um, as far as why it's ongoing, um, the intent is to scale up the activity with the one-time funding amount but keep the program going into the future with a smaller appropriation to make it, it's gonna take more money to start it, less money to keep it going. Senator Anderson. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I guess I just think that uh, this is a good program and should go further than just the two years, but uh, we'll see how it goes in the next one. Members, any other moments of uh, questions or, or uh, comments? And Senator Gustafson, closing comments. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I'd like to thank the groups that did all of the work to develop this program and entrusted me to uh, get it to this stage. I'd also like to point out that given how much um, our farmers do for our state's economy, food supply, way of life, and one-time appropriation of 10 million with 2 million a year ongoing is a pretty small ask. Um, I just want to thank everybody again for their time, and I encourage you to support this bill and support our farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Senate File 1245 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, the next bill that we have before us is Senate File 1522, Senator Kupek.
Senator Kupek, to your bill. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, hospitals, clinics, vet offices around the U.S. and in the past year have been turning animals away uh, because they are short-staffed. This is, this is nothing new for farmers. For decades, farmers have endured a shortage of rural veterinarians, uh, the kind of people who specialize in animals like cows, pigs, and sheep. Uh, but the problem is now at an all-time high, with 500 counties across 46 states uh, reporting critical shortages uh, just this last year alone. Uh, SF 1522 is a bill that would provide a voluntary pathway for licensure for veterinary technicians. Uh, the legislation would improve veterinary practices, efficiency through greater utilization of vet techs. It would recognize the education and skills that credentialed veterinary technicians possess and will lead to improved working conditions and retention. Licensed vet techs would be defined in the bill, but licensure would not be mandatory. So it is a voluntary program. If a veterinarian does not want to hire a licensed vet tech or a vet tech wants to continue in their current capacity, they can. So nothing for them will change except their title. What it does do, though, is expand what veterinary technicians can do if they are licensed. And with a growing shortage of veterinarians and four-year retention rates in the veterinary tech pro profession, uh, this will help alleviate overloaded practice and make the industry more efficient. Minnesota is one of only eight states in the country that does not regulate vet techs. There are presently no professional requirements needed for them to work in veterinary medicine, a job that does include dispensing controlled substances and educating the public on the health and welfare of their pets and animals. This bill would improve and enhance public safety by requiring accountability and oversight with a, with a mechanism to investigate misconduct like drug diversion. Licensed vet techs would be defined in the bill, but again, licensure is not mandatory. Chairman yeah. members, I have uh, two testifiers with me today that uh, will speak to the bill and uh, they'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Senator Kubek. My understanding is we have two folks here to testify uh, on behalf of this bill, Ms. Horn and Mr. Belay. If you would please uh, come to the, the uh, uh, table. Uh, Ms. Horn, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Putnam, Vice Chair Kupek, and committee members for your time today. I also want to thank Senator Kupek for chief authoring this bill. My name is Kim Horn, and I have worked as a veterinary technician for over 40 years. I chair the Minnesota Association of Veterinary Technicians Credentials Committee, which reviews our existing 2,700 voluntarily certified vet techs. Veterinary technicians often serve on the front lines of veterinary businesses and we play a key role in keeping the public safe by being competent in the recognition and prevention of infectious and zoonotic diseases, both in our companion and farm animals. The agriculture sector in Minnesota depends on animal health professionals in a variety of areas. This bill aims to expand what a licensed veterinary technician can do. Licensure is not mandatory, so businesses can continue to operate as they are currently. But for those vet techs, both certified and non-certified, that choose to become licensed, they can be better utilized and improve efficiencies in our profession. By legally allowing the veterinarian to supervise remotely and to delegate the supervisory responsibility of non-licensed employees to the licensed veterinary technician, this will all help to free up the veterinarian's time in both metro and rural areas. Having definitions that align with the American Veterinary Medical Association and allowing supervisory authority to be delegated to a licensed veterinary technician will enhance how veterinary medicine is able to be practiced in Minnesota. I am quite concerned with the current trend of losing more vet techs than we are gaining. This contributes to the critical shortage we are experiencing in the veterinary industry. Veterinary technicians who are fully utilized and have title protection are more likely to stay in the career field. Retaining these individuals is a great start to addressing the worker shortage. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Now, uh, Dr. Belay, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. 
Yes, thank you, Chair Putnam and Senators. Uh, my name is Al or Al ba Alan Bailey. I am uh, a veterinarian. I want to thank Senator Kupek for supporting this bill and bringing it forward. I'm a practicing equine veterinarian. I'm also a faculty member at Ridgewater College in Wilmer, and I am also the chairperson of the Minnesota Veterinary Medical Association's Veterinary Technician Committee. Ridgewater College is one of only four min state or min skew state colleges that offers the veterinary technician program. You may recall that in 2016, we had 12 veterinary technician teaching programs in the state. Now we've just got the four state colleges. My first key point, the Minnesota Veterinary Medical Association and the Minnesota Association of Veterinary Technicians have worked together to support this legislation with the intent of bringing Minnesota up to U.S. industry standards and to reduce the shortage of veterinary technicians. We not only have a shortage of veterinary technicians in the United States and Minnesota, but we're on the cusp of significant shortage of veterinarians in this country. It is predicted that by just 2030, we will be short 10,000 veterinarians in the United States. Now, to give you a perspective, there's only 130,000 practicing veterinarians in the United States. This is a significant reduction. My second key point, veterinary technicians are voluntarily certified in Minnesota through the Minnesota Veterinary Medical Association. As chair, I'm informed when there has been a complaint that comes to the association about a veterinary technician's misconduct. Examples of misconduct would be taking a client's, a pet owning client's credit card and using it for their personal purchases, and also drug diversions. Because their certification is voluntary, the association can do nothing. Unfortunately, these employees involved in drug diversions often are fired go down the street and go to work at another veterinary clinic where they may have an opportunity to divert additional controlled substances. We believe firmly that licensure of veterinary technicians will provide state oversight as well as a mechanism for investigation and potential discipline of these individuals for their misconduct. My last point, the bill, this bill was developed using national models including definitions and scope of practice. Both the associations are working together to endorse a path towards licensure for veterinary technicians. Therefore, we have proposed a voluntary licensure with a lenient grandfather clause. We thank you for your time and ask for your support. Thank you, Dr. Bailey, and I apologize for what I did to your name. Uh, I, I tried a little too hard. I uh, appreciate you being here and your testimony. Uh, members, uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, discussion of the bill? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, to one of the testifiers, I guess, uh, whoever wants to take it. Um, my understanding is the license would uh, allow in some situations uh, a vet tech uh, to, or, or would allow a vet tech to um, maybe administer some shots and things? Is there some expansion of uh, some of the scope currently um, that's allowed? And secondly, do we have some unintended consequences of you're, you're thinking this will bring more people to your um, to the workforce, but licensing can also have the opposite of effect, and then people don't go into the business go into that area of occupation and so can you talk about that and the concern about maybe we we uh, don't have people f coming to getting more licenses uh, for for this line of work dr bailey or miss horn dr bailey yes thank you mr chair and senator westrom and and please correct me if i don't answer your question fully sir uh, Veterinary technicians are responsible for multiple injections. They are providing nursing care to the animals under the direction of a licensed veterinarian. Uh, you are probably well aware that the veterinary technician can do everything except those that are the responsibilities exclusively of the veterinarian, which is diagnosis, prescription of drugs, and surgery. 
So veterinary technicians are every day working in veterinary clinics now under the direction of the veterinarian. Currently, the way our statute is written, though, the veterinarian needs to be in direct visual or auditory contact with the patient being worked on. One of the provisions in this bill would allow for remote supervision of a veterinary technician by the veterinarian. This is where we feel it may be a huge enhancement to practices, not just metro, but certainly in rural areas. And I could give you examples if you were interested, but I could see how this could help my equine practice as an example. The second part of your question, I'm going to ask for clarification, please, Senator. Senator Westrom. Well, thank you. Uh, and I guess the clarification is sometimes we license more and more people, and it just um, drives others out of that arena because they either don't want to go into it full time and don't want to put into it what now a license would take where they could otherwise go to the vet, uh, vet business and take on the job uh, and get trained while they're doing it. Um, and, and so I'm concerned that we just add more licenses and we probably uh, have have fewer people looking to go into that arena potentially uh, by, by making it harder to get into being a vet tech. Dr. Bailey? Chair Putnam, thank you. And Senator Westrom, thanks for that clarification. Uh, we feel, and the research has shown across the nation, that by empower, empowering the veterinary technician and by recognizing them and utilizing their skills, they are much more likely to stay in the career field. We've currently got over 2,700 voluntarily certified veterinary technicians in Minnesota, and our surveys have showed that the great majority of them are on board and want to be, desire to be licensed. Again, this is coming forward from both the associations, of the Veterinary Medical Association, as well as the Association of Veterinary Technicians. They are asking for this, we veterinarians are asking for it because we believe it will keep more people in the career field. We do not believe it will be an impediment to reduce or any lead to any reduction in the number of people going into the career field. Dr. Bailey, if, if I may have follow up, Senator Westrom, uh, uh, just very quickly, is there a sense that uh, with licensure will come increased compensation? Yes, Senator or Chair Putnam, we believe yes, it may lead to some increases in compensation. What we're seeing in the industry, though, is because of the tremendous shortage, wages have gone up quite significantly in just the last few years. I apologize for interrupting, Senator Westrom. It would continue. Okay. Uh, Senator Kunish. Thank you very much. I was just formulating my question here. Um, so we have, um, right now, we have non-certified uh, uh, veterinary technicians. Um, and they, if I have this straight, they cannot perform procedures without the veterinarian either being in visual or audio space, correct? Thank you. And um, if they were to, and if you're making this voluntarily certified, um, that would mean that those that are not certified would still not be able to perform those procedures. Am I right? Dr. Bailey? Thank you, Chair Putnam and Senator. Uh, I probably need to back up a little bit. Again, as I said, the veterinarian has to be in direct auditory or visual range of any patient being worked on. The, term, the, the language in this bill would allow licensed veterinary technicians to supervise other unlicensed employees mm -hmm. And I apologize that I didn't say that. The way our current law is, the only one that's recognized is the veterinarian. Everyone else, everyone else in a veterinary facility is considered an unlicensed employee. There is no restrictions on what that employee can do. We, again, we feel this will help with the manpower shortage, the workforce shortage, because the veterinary technician who's licensed will be able to supervise some of the actions of the other unlicensed employees. Did that clarify? Senator Kunish? Yes, it did, thank you. And one more question, please. Senator Kunish. So I see that you have um, in here um, 
specifications for non-resident licensed uh, veterinary technicians. And I'm going to assume that because a lot of our farms are near the borders of other states, that um, that is to allow, and maybe I'm assuming this, um, uh, uh, veterinarian technicians, if they're licensed in Minnesota, to be able to come from another state, perform those duties. Um, and I'm wondering if there's reciprocity um, between all the states that we border with. Dr. Bailey. Chair Putnam, and I, and I hope I understand your question. If I don't, please uh, clarify. Uh, reciprocity is not a given because individuals in 42 other states license or regulate their veterinary technicians. So reciprocity would not necessarily be given. What we do see, though, is that licensed veterinary technicians will have greater ability to move to other states where they are regulated. One of the other interesting thing about this licensure bill would be that in the event of any sort of national disaster, and I think of some of the hurricanes that have occurred down south, the licensed veterinary technician would be able to go into those states and be able to provide assistance for the care for animals. Currently, unlicensed employees, which is what they are here in Minnesota, cannot participate with national disasters and assisting with animals that are injured in those areas. Did that answer your question, Senator? Senator Kunish. It does, but now I have one more question. So um, does that mean that if they are licensed in Minnesota, if, you know, if they voluntarily license um, themselves, does that mean that they then can practice anywhere in the United States with that license? Is it, accept, is it a, like, accepted everywhere? Dr. Bailey. Uh, thank you, Chair Putnam. Uh, no, they would have to get their regulation, whatever that state. The different states use different languages. Mm -hmm. Some states call them registered veterinary technicians. Some call them licensed veterinary technicians. And a few states, still under state regulations, call them certified. For a technician to work, unless it's a national disaster, for them to work in another state, they would have to apply through that state's regulatory authority to become licensed, certified, or uh, regulated, registered in that state. Thank you. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> under the same heading of non-residents licensed veterinary technicians, it talks about um, uh, being able to get a certificate of satisfactory completion of the PAVE program. Could someone explain what that PAVE program is? Dr. Bailey? Uh, Chair Putnam the, and, and Senator Anderson, the PAVE program refers to the licensure of veterinarians, nothing to do with veterinary technicians. Our licensure, both veterinarians uh, and Veterinary technician, the scope of practice and the definitions come from the American Association of Veterinary State Boards, and that's the overarching national organization that oversees the testing uh, and the state regulation or the oversight of, of all the state regulations. So the PAVE program, and I'm sorry I don't remember what that acronym stands for, I could certainly find out, but it is related to the licensure of veterinarians. Follow-up? Senator Anderson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Kubek, uh, the effective date of this is effective July 1, 2025. Why so far out? Why not this year? Senator Kubek. I, I think it, I think we were waiting on, on the, 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 the fiscal note on that, and I think also we were thinking that this would give some time to, to ramp up on licensure over that time frame is, is the understanding that I have. Just Senator Anderson. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I think this is a good program. I think it, we should, uh, as much as possible, put this into, as much of this bill can be put into effect, we should put it into effect this year, unless there's some major something holding us back from doing that. Yes, sure. absolutely. Dr. Bailey? Chair Putnam and Senator Anderson, the reason for the two years, we'd, we'd like the bill to go into effect. We'd appreciate your support. 
the reason for the two years is that the Board of Veterinary Medicine, which will be the state agency that oversees this, has asked for a minimum of 12 to 18 months to write the rules. They'll be opening up the Veterinary Practice Act to include language, including the licensed veterinary technician. And so there are a number of us that have already been asked to participate in some of that rulemaking that will have to occur. Since the Board of Veterinary Medicine asked for 12 to 18 months, that was the reason for the suggestion of two years. Thank you, Dr. Bedding. Uh, members, any further uh, questions or comments or discussion? Senator Kubek, if you would please, your closing comments. Sure. First, too, I want to thank Senator Dames also for co-sponsoring on this bill. And I, too, when this first bill came before me as Senator Westrom also, I had some skepticism, too. I thought, oh, wait, are we putting more restrictions on it? But to me, this, this is because it is voluntary. It is much more to me like a carrot rather than a stick. It's holding something out there. If you get this, attain this licensure, you'll be able to do more. And then that, too, will open up those, as you said, those shortages where we're seeing vets out, particularly in rural areas, allow them to do more and cover more ground and, and eventually help out our agricultural community as well. So uh, I would appreciate your support. Thank you, Senator Kubek, and uh, thank you to uh, our guests uh, for testifying. Uh, members, as Senator Kubek mentioned, we're still waiting on a fiscal note for this thing. So we're going to hold it over for possible inclusion and likely send it over to the Finance Committee. Uh, once we get that fiscal note. Uh, Senator Westrom. That answered my question, Mr. Chair. I was wondering what we were doing with the bill today. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, members, that's uh, the end of our business that we have before us today. Coming up on uh, Wednesday, it's Sugar Beet Growers Day at the Capitol, uh, which is cool. Uh, the bills that we were here that day were Senate File 1524 by Senator Gustafson about the uh, Agriculture Utilization Research Institute appropriation. We'll also hear Senate File 1525 by Senator Kupek, the Agriculture Utilization Research Institute appropriation for specific purposes. Uh, then we will hear Senate File 1563 from Senator Leesky, cottage food exemption modification. So, then we will hear Senate File 1407 from Senator Dames, Minnesota Agricultural Education and Leadership Council grants appropriation. And then last, we will again hear from Senator Kupek, Senate File 1773, University of Minnesota Employee Veterinary Medicine Licensure Modification. So that's what we'll be talking about on Wednesday. Uh, until then, there being no further business before the committee, the committee is adjourned. <laughs>